Welcome, everybody, to episode 69 of Radicalized Truth Survives. I'm Heidi Kuda. I'm with Jim Stewartson and High Fidelity. We are an investigative show about disinformation, and those who've been watching us for a few years know that we continually emphasize uh, bringing reporting in live from Ukraine, and we are doing that today with Zarina Zabriski, who's been on our show many times, and uh, we're super happy to have her here with us today, although the interview is very distressing um, and very, very fucking important. Gentlemen, do you want to say anything before we jump into Front Loaded? No, just what, this, what you said. Well, I just... Don't wait for the interview. That's that's the important part here. Yeah. Yeah, I, I feel like this interview, you know, given what happened with Ukraine funding being dropped from the CR yesterday, uh, this interview should be an indictment of everyone who voted for that and didn't stand up. Uh, yeah, Ukraine. especially when the majority of Americans want us to support Ukraine. So once again, you know, what are we doing? All right. So on that note, we are going to jump into Front Loaded. Front Loaded. We are going to start with Timothy Snyder, the Yale professor who has been reporting and working in uh, Ukraine. And he also wrote the book on tyranny. And if you've not seen his series, The Making of Modern Ukraine, then you are missing out. But he wrote, um, on the anniversary of Neville Chamberlain's speech justifying the abandonment of democratic Czechoslovakia, and on the day the US passed its continuing budget resolution without aid for Ukraine, this little bit of art from the Ukrainian Defense Ministry. Let's cue it up, hi fi. They admire so much as strength, and there is nothing for which they have less respect than for weakness. Ich bin ein feeling. Tear down this wall. Slava našim zahiznikam. Slava našim zahiznicim. Slava Ukraini. решение о проведении специальной военной операции. Yeah, so I think he makes his point. To say the least. But <laughs> I, I listen to Timothy Snyder. Um, yeah, I'll have something to say about that. Uh, okay. As well. okay, perfect. Yeah. So, um, and of course, my dad being from Czechoslovakia, he's he was from a German community in Czechoslovakia. But all this stuff, it's not, it's not like you know history. This is what Jim always says. This is like you know plagiarizing history. What's occurring right now? Um, so let's go back to Timothy Snyder because he's a very very important voice, uh, and I'm very grateful for his work. He also wrote yesterday, supporting Ukraine is a once in a generation chance to make the world safer. Ending that support is recklessness for which we will suffer in all the conflicts that the Ukrainians are preventing or making less likely. Let us help those who help us. Please listen to his words. Please listen to what Zarina is going to tell you and please put pressure on the politicians who are supposed to work for us to do exactly what Tim Snyder is saying. Jim? Yeah, I, uh, uh, if, if I get started, I will uh, I will get started during Hellscape, let's put it that way. Uh, I agree, obviously, uh, with um, Timothy Snyder. Um, everyone should pay attention to what he has to say. And what happened yesterday to me was an absolute disgrace. 
Um, and, you know, like I said, I'll, I'll talk about it a little bit. I look forward to it. Hi, Fi. It just, it, you know, what, once every couple of generations, uh, evil tries again, right? Uh, yeah. And it is up to the people of that age to rise up and meet that evil. Um, and it feels like we are failing fucking miserably. And I am not impressed. And uh, listen, Russia isn't going to stop at Ukraine. Right? Yeah. Poland's next. If Poland doesn't, you know, just decide to join up voluntarily. And then Which Germany. Which we've seen before. Yeah. Right? So, and we, know what, what, we know what happens. All I'm saying is I would much rather pay for this war in American dollars and American hardware than American blood. And Europe's blood. So it's it's a global problem. So speaking of the evil that Hi-Fi just referenced, uh, Vladimir Putin said yesterday that he insisted the residents of four Ukrainian regions that Moscow illegally annexed a year ago made their choice to be with their fatherland. That is what we call propaganda. That is what we call a lie. And just uh, a few minutes ago, a colleague of mine sent me another item about how in Russia, uh, the deputy chairman of the state Duma, Tolstoy, said that Russia should annex four more regions of Ukraine, among them Odessa, which we are going to talk about with Zarina, uh, who has a lot of family roots there, and she's going to teach everybody a wonderful new phrase. But the bottom line is that this particular reporter noted another reminder that Russia is waging an ambiguous war of territorial conquest. Why this is important is what Putin has been successful at has been information warfare, creating an unreality, propaganda. But the people who have inoculation to that happen to live in Ukraine. When we interviewed a Ukrainian soldier, Volodymyr Demchenko, he had something to say about where those who create unreality and force people to live in them uh, actually will end up. So let's see that clip you an, an example of how I see Russia and their propaganda uh, way of thinking. Imagine you are in a bar, yeah, and you have a nice uh, time with your friends, and you just having fun. And there is always a guy in the bar who is just staring at you. And he already wants to fight with you, and everybody know it, you know, and you can pretend he is not there. You can pretend like you are avoiding him, la, la, la. but there is only two way to solve this question. Or you ending your beautiful evening with friends and just leaving, which will be smart if you are able to do that. Or you need to fight this bully. <laughs> there is only one uh, chance to do it. And with Russia propaganda channels, uh, you need to make them forbidden. It's lie. It's just lies. They're ruining the world. According to Aristotle, when you are saying lie, you are creating world which doesn't exist, and you put people into world which doesn't exist. So, and one moment we realize uh, that it was not true. They need to build a, their world from a scratch, and that's why Dante put uh, traitors in the worst place of hell, because they are creating a world which doesn't exist and force people to live in a world which doesn't exist. I just think that's just so brilliant and it never, ever, ever gets old. Please watch that full episode on RadPod. We'll post the link to it um, in our notes for this episode. Yeah, so speaking of traitors and monsters, I just uh, finished in the wee hours my American Monster report number eight. This one is on Robert Mercer. Um, I encourage folks to at least uh, read the preview of it because it's really freaking important. Um, Robert Mercer uh, has used his money to damn democracy straight to hell. And I document all the connections between him and uh, the Russians. And it's uh, staggering. So that's it for Front Loaded, guys. So why it matters. Why high fidelity? First story this week. 
Luxury Corrupts. And this story comes to us out of France because the billionaire owner, Bernard Arnault, is under investigation in Paris over uh, transactions with a Russian oligarch about real estate, um, moving Russian money through real estate. Do we know anyone uh, who sounds like that? Anyone relevant? Funny. I just wrote about that last night. I read about the oligarch whose yacht was next to Mercer's, who also spent $50 million extra on a property of a uh, Palm Beach property of uh, Donald Jessica Trump. So, LOL. Yeah, it seems like, uh, you know, when we interviewed Craig Unger and he found, you know, a thousand or 10,000, whatever the number was, I forget. Uh, all those Russian condos under the Trump brand. Oh, um, yeah. 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 Uh, no, like... Or, yeah, if we, if we look at uh, Sergey Grishin's ties to uh, real estate companies, it's, it's a theme. And it's one of the reasons we really need beneficial ownership laws in this country. And not just in this country, as this article shows, uh, but also around the world. Next story this week. The Silicon Valley pusher man. And the story comes to us out of the Department of Justice and uh, one of their many trials against big technology because Department of Justice shared a document this week that uh, Google did not want the public to get a hold of in which they claim that uh, people become addicted to their search engine just like cigarettes or drugs. Why this is important. Uh, People need to understand the ways in which corporate media manipulates people, the way the digital surface manipulates people, the way social media manipulates people. I'm hoping that more and more of our audience are getting this and they're sharing it with uh, friends and acquaintances. And that's why. Yeah. When I first started, you know, looking into QAnon, I, you know, would search for it on Google and get sponsored ads, sponsored ads for QAnon websites with like the introduction to QAnon, you know, six videos that are basically guaranteed to, you know, pull you into a death call. It was like Google selling advertisement to it. Now, since I think they've kind of, you know, figured out that that's not a good look, um, but where do pe- where do people find all their disinformation? Where do people find the poison uh, to to pump into their heads that they're addicted to because they've been you know addicted to it by uh, foreign enemy nation states? It's time for us to start realizing that our own infrastructure, our search engines, our social media, was designed by sociopaths with Russian money. Yeah. Let's fucking figure it out. Yeah, so I want to say that um, the highest donor to a nonprofit, quote unquote, that was using Facebook and Google to uh, micro-target people in swing states with anti-Muslim advertisements was Robert Mercer. This was from a 2018 investigation. So using Google and Facebook were these completely, uh, I I think it's just evil. Well, I mean, Mercer's been laundering Putin's money for forever, right? I mean, that's the, that's the reason because like, like the Republicans, like so many people, he's completely compromised, right? He has to do Putin's bidding. And so it's a it's a it's a mutually parasitic relationship, <laughs> right? Uh, where you know like- he's he's getting shitloads of uh, billions of dollars flowing through his his businesses, um, you know that gets kicked back in you know propaganda and and messaging uh, that serves Putin's purposes. And, you know, it's about time we we stop allowing these fucking psychopaths to sort themselves to the to the top and and make more of themselves. I'm tired of it. 
Thank you. I think I'm going to be adding that quote into my report because that was uh, incredible. I do want to say one thing, speaking of sociopaths laundering money, back to your first report, Hi-Fi, the investigation that I referenced in one of my reports came from BuzzFeed. Their records showed that more than 1,300 Trump condominiums were bought not by people, but by shell companies, and that the purchases were made without a mortgage, avoiding inquiries from lenders. So that is the number that you were looking for. Uh, why that's really important is that Trump at the time was only one of two uh, real estate developers who were allowing the anonymous purchases. And boy, did that lead to a, a gigantic uh, calamity for our country. So thank you for that. What you got next? Final story this week. Fitzo scores. This story comes to us out of Slovakia, where far-right candidate Robert Fitzo uh, won the election, and he won it by taking the stance that Ukraine is nobody's problem but Ukraine's. And uh, this campaign was obviously bolstered by a ton of disinformation spread through corporate media in Slovakia. And, uh, you know, we've talked... uh, to some of our guests in the, from the Czech Republic about how misinformation is being used in those countries. Um, it's just another symptom. I don't understand why more isn't being done. Thank you for that high fi And we are going to do a breaker with a reporter from Czech Republic um, this week. So uh, we will be discussing exactly that, uh, the same infiltration. Are we, are, we, are we tired of Putin just, just like, rolling into countries with information warfare and active me- measures and taking them over. Isn't this, is this something we should fucking do something about? I'm just, you know, maybe that's, a good you, you would think you would, you would think, uh, you know, we probably, yeah. uh, good well, place. I think this is a perfect place to roll in hellscape. Jim Stewartson's hellscape. Oh, fuck. So listen here, friends, Um, Democrats, liberals, centrists, I don't give a shit if you call yourself a Republican, uh, you know, but are not a a fascist. Get your shit together. And I'm talking specifically right now to the leadership of the Democratic Party and everyone who reflexively gathers around the you know the the propaganda that comes out of of our own side right so people people get mad at me when i criticize my own my own team but guess what that's how you make a team strong that's how you actually make yourself effective if you're attacking people because they're criticizing our side because we're ineffective, you're the problem. So let listen up. Yesterday, after a, a kabuki, where Kevin McFutnuts comes in with a pile of shit sandwiches, and forgive my fucking language right now, and says, here's 10 shit sandwiches. We're going to put this in our bill. Right. After they've held the country hostage, held held disaster victims, military families, people. In, so, I mean, across the board. People are were going to be hurting from this. Right. So Kevin. With a cue comes in with a with and shit sandwiches and says here. If you want to, if you want to save, save the country, save your veterans, you know, you're going to have to eat these. And the, 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 the Democrats whine and whine and, oh, we're going to, we're going to fight back. And guess what? Kevin says, never mind. Nine of these, I'm going to take off. Here's, I only have one shit sandwich left for you. Just one. You win. You want 90% of what you wanted, right? And what happens? The fucking Democrats eat it up. Yum, yum. That sounds good. 
we got what we wanted. And guess what? We can go and make big flowery floor speeches about how fucking awesome we are. And in the meantime, that one shit sandwich is is what we've been talking about and what we're about to talk about with Zareen. A fucking war criminal who has every intention, as stated by his by himself, to expand into Europe, to expand beyond his borders in Asia, to expand across the planet. And Democrats are patting themselves on the back because they didn't eat nine shit sandwiches, ten, they only ate one. And in the meantime, a bunch of us are out here going like, wait a second, what do you mean? You only ate one shit sandwich. And all sorts of, some, ooh, I'm super blue, well, blue, Democrat. Fuck off, man. You need to understand what just happened. I will be a Democrat my entire life. I am, I am blue, blue and on as, as it gets. But when my party does something that feckless and embarrassing, they need to be called out for it, not celebrated. So the comptroller of the Pentagon on the same day that the U.S. Congress, that the Democrats decided to eat one shit sandwich, said out loud to the same house, we're out of money. We literally have no money in the account to give to Ukraine for what they need. So the Democrats, oh, we'll get it next week. Because Kevin promised us. Oh, my fucking God. Right? Really? The same Kevin? <laughs> the same party that has been doing everything in its power. Every single little crack that we give them, every little step that they can take towards fascism, they take. How are we so feckless and gullible that we fall for this football that Lucy puts in front of us every single time? We are beyond politics in the United States. This is no longer politics. It's geopolitics and warfare, information warfare. Those are the only two relevant domains right now. U.S. politics doesn't exist anymore. It's about people attacking the United States and people defending the United States. It's that simple. I don't give a shit. What you call yourself, I really don't. I don't care what you believe. I don't give a shit. But if you think it's okay that that we're allowing a foreign enemy war criminal to affect our U.S. policy in this very specific way, you're not paying attention. Ukraine is the target of this entire thing. As anyone who's been watching this knows, I focus on Mike Flynn. What, how did Mike Flynn get started on his adventure to treason? He took a trip to GRU headquarters in June 2013, and in February 2014, Putin just rolled into to Crimea with no U.S. intelligence uh, warnings at all, except from the CIA. He just rolled right in with what? GRU soldiers. We're dealing with a long plan, multiple decades. Ten years before that happened, before Mike Flynn went to GRU headquarters, Putin hired who? Paul fucking Manafort to set the stage. He's just better at both strategic long-term planning um, and he's 
vastly better, and I'm talking about Putin, an information war. We have got to understand what this is, what the stakes are, and stop being so gullible. If, if we do what we did in 2016 and 2015 again, which is allow ourselves to be pulled down this, this pathway, it's done. We're done. Country's done. It's, it's really, really, really that simple. So when our elected officials who are supposed to be defending democracy, defending the interests of the United States, go on a, on a, on a back padding tour um, because they caved on the most and only important issue to the Putin caucus, uh, we've got a real problem because that means we not only have to fight their side, we have to fight our side. And I'm fucking sick of it. So, uh, last thing. Pressure. Pressure, 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 pressure. It's the only thing that works. We have to put pressure on the media to start telling us what is happening. Information, psychological warfare. We have to stop treating this like politics. Is it? Have to get the government to bullshitting us. I'm sorry. I, I I thought the president gave an amazing speech, but he didn't say the word Russia once. He didn't say Putin, Kremlin, Russia. He 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 talked about extreme MAGA Republicans. That's a euphemism. That is a euphemism for people who have been brainwashed into pro-Putin propaganda. Don't use euphemisms anymore. It's a fucking war. So across the board, I, I am very concerned that we are we are setting ourselves up for another 2016. And the the opposition has had eight years now. Mike Flynn and his fucking propagandists have had eight years to perfect this. And we haven't even acknowledged it yet. So I'm just asking my friends here, um, look, it, it's, it's, it's time to, to suit up and, and stop being afraid. Stop being afraid of what people are going to say when you speak the fucking truth. It, it's, it's, it's go time, you guys. We got a, we got a, we got a, a, a year. Um, and everybody on this podcast, if the wrong team wins, it, it's existential. Not just for us, but for all of us. Arrest my phone. So as Jim just said, this is all part of the same war, and we are now going to be moving from the invisible part of the war, which should be very visible to people now, but you know, still is not, unfortunately to the very, very visible physical part of the war with our dear friend, reporter Zarina Zabriskie, American reporter, has lived in America for 25 years, but when the war in Ukraine, when the full-scale invasion broke out, she went to Ukraine to document it. She's an author, a poet, and now a war correspondent. And she has been bringing daily reports from the front uh, since the war began. And this is one of her reports. And why don't you roll that clip now, Hi-Fi? This is my house. This are two windows. And this is the kitchen over here. And this is where I was at that time. And so it hit the house right behind us. Thank you. 
Zarina, we are so happy to see you back here. We're happy to see you safe and sound. Please tell us what we just saw uh, in that video. Tell us more about what that was about. Well, hi, Heidi and Jim and Hi-Fi and hello to everyone. Thank you for being here. I'm talking to you from Kherson and the video was shot in Kherson on the third day as we arrived and just a few hours after we had a meeting in front of the house. We interviewed several uh, people from this neighborhood uh, and went uh, to interview more people. Meanwhile, there was information passed on, as we later found out, about us working in the city of Kherson. And the Russians, who are located just anywhere from 5 to 10 kilometers and further on across the river, hit the site. Um, and this is what you've seen. Fortunately, there was no one in the house that was destroyed. Uh, the neighbors had their windows damaged, the walls damaged. Fortunately, the neighbors were okay. They might have not been okay. And right after that, uh, we moved places and we were in a different place. And as I was working on a podcast that I'm doing right now for Malcontent News and doing an interview with my American Polish colleague, we were hit again. So the windows were broken. And that's when we realized that we're being hunted. Uh, and so we had to move again. And so since then, we've been on the move. And this is the situation here. Um, there are very few people left in the city of Kherson. And initially, before the full-scale Russian invasion, there were almost 300,000 people. It's a big city. Now it's very similar to a ghost city. It, in fact, it reminds me of Pripyat near Chernobyl, uh, especially after 3 p.m. and definitely after 5 p.m. The curfew is at 8 but if you walk the streets at five, they're just stray dogs running around and the leaves being blown across the streets. And occasionally you run into possibly Russian spies taking pictures. It's a very intense, um, dangerous situation. But the worst part and the reason why I wanted to speak to all of you and to, to everybody who is listening about the situation is because the attacks on Kherson from the other side have intensified dramatically. And because of this situation, the only two foreign journalists based in Kherson right now is myself and my colleague uh, Paul Conroy. Uh, a part of our film crew. We're working on the next film about Kherson. Um, also, we know um, that the documents about us being here were leaked to the other side, and they know that we're here. Um, so it's understandable that there are not very many journalists from abroad covering the situation. But we have to bring the message to the world because um, yesterday there were about, I believe, 105 attacks on Kherson and Kherson Oblast. Mm -hmm. With uh, every day there anywhere from five to 10 uh, aerial bombs being dropped on residential areas. And they also use pretty much anything at their disposal. Um, heavy artillery, mortar, tanks, drones. Today, a drone dropped explosives on the residential house, and a mother with three kids had to be saved from underneath the burning ruins. And we hear uh, the rumbling of the explosions uh, pretty much regularly, anywhere from every 10 minutes to every five minutes. And occasionally there would be like an hour break and silence, and then it starts again. And uh, it is very clear that the intent of the Russian military is to erase the city from the face of earth, the way they did with Mariupol, the way they did with Bakhmut, the way they did in Avdiivka. And there is no uh, word coming on it into the 
outside world. The world doesn't know that it's happening. So I'm very grateful for this opportunity to bring this message to you. And um, I, I get back to you guys for, for some feedback and I'd be happy to tell you more on what's going on here. Oh my God, as somebody who loves you, my heart's like, get out. As somebody who's an investigative reporter, my heart is like, thank God you're there. Thank God you're documenting this. But Zarina, this is madness. Just as your film that you did, the first film uh, with the byline team showed, there are war crimes ongoing every day being documented by people such as yourself and people like Paul Conroy. If you weren't there, we wouldn't even know this was happening. It's so important that you're there. And what else? Like, what, I don't even know what to ask you. I'm just like, I'm devastated by this news. Well, uh, thank you for your compassion. We are just here doing our work. The compassion goes to the people of Kherson. There are many children who are here. There are mostly civilian, civilians who are here. The reason they can't um, be evacuated, technically they can, and they are being evacuated, but it's somewhat of a trap, as the locals explain to us. There's very little money right now in the region because the city went through uh, invasion, nine months of occupation and Russian looting. Then uh, about since November, almost a year of incessant shelling. And also in summer, there was the explosion of Novokohovka Dam and there was a major flooding that destroyed a lot of houses, a lot of residential areas. Of course, there are no jobs here and there is no money. So people who want to evacuate with their families don't have enough means to go somewhere and rent a place. There is help from the state, uh, but many people prefer to stay in their own houses rather than living in communal um, situation like a gym you know, or a stadium with their children uh, having very little to eat or to live on. And they risk their life, not on a daily basis, but on an hourly basis. And we have visited some uh, residences by the river where people hiding in the storages with the whole families for hours, mm -hmm. nights on end. And we, we have the footage, we have the photographs, we're working on the documentary now. And for those who are not very familiar with the geography, which is understandable, um, Kherson, the city of Kherson is located for the most part on the right, so-called right bank of the river. The Russians are on the left bank of the river. So imagine if you're in London, there would be the River Thames, where Big Ben would be on your side and the enemy would be shooting at you from across the river. Or if you wow. think uh, closer to the home, say Manhattan, right? There would be, it's, it's similar in a way, there would be, uh, the adversary would be in Brooklyn with you being on Manhattan. They even have an island called Quarantine Island, which served in the past, in the 19th century, as a Quarantine Island, kind of like Alice Island, where the sailors from around the world would stay a little bit to quarantine. So that island is completely flooded with water. Uh, it, it, it's constantly under fire. Uh, there's still people living there. And um, so is the whole front two rows of the houses along the river, which used to be a very good uh, location. Everybody wanted to be there because the Dnipro River is beautiful um, and uh, it's very desirable. There are beautiful houses. Some houses would be like in Malibu, you know, with the mansions. Wow. Wow. And, uh, but, but it's mixed because there are a lot of somewhat poor houses that we we went through it's like in any city there yeah are people there are rich people there are a lot of middle class yeah. for the most part middle class their life wasn't luxurious before the war 
but it was very good because Ukrainians are very um, industrious. They work a lot. They love good life. There are beautiful mm. cafes, beautiful restaurants, amazing food even now. Under this shelling, we go to a couple of cafes that were like, the food is amazing. You've um, always said that. You've always said that, which is so remarkable. I'm looking at a map right now and you can see how close uh, to the river is and how bananas it must be to have enemy fire right on the other side. Guys, jump in. I'm, I'm a, I am don't even know what to say. Yeah, it, it, it is difficult to know what to say. Um, you know, and forgive me, Zarina, for being, you know, uh, American centric for a moment, but we've, we just had a, um, you know, a, a, our Congress, uh, left out funding for Ukraine in their latest bill um, in order to placate the Republicans. Um, and I just want to say to anybody here that's, that's listening, um, we, and I've, I've written about this, in my view, we're the Western front of what's happening to Zarina in real time. We're in information war in order to prevent us from helping um, the people that Zarina is reporting on. And um, so I just wanted to say that to our viewers, the, it is absolutely critical that we keep pressure on our government and, and our military to continue to support um, the people of Ukraine, because otherwise what Zarina is describing will come to the rest of Europe and then it will come here. Um, so just, I'm so grateful always for you being here, Zarina. I wanted to, to I'm curious if you noticed or, or if you, if people there that you've spoken to noticed any difference in the way the Russians behaved after Wagner got kind of decommissioned uh, a, a few months ago after Prigozhin uh, had his adventure into Russia. Um, is, is there, has there been any kind of on the ground sort of um, tactical changes that, that have happened over the last few months as a result? Um, a great point. Thank you for saying this. Of course, everybody here is very aware of what's happening in America right now about the Congress decision. It's devastating. It's devastating to Ukrainians. It's devastating to myself. And for those who are not familiar with me, I there is an accent, but I am an American journalist and an American writer based in Ukraine. I'm not a Ukrainian. And um, it is painful to see um the breach of trust uh and it's painful to see that the kremlin propaganda has achieved what it has been meaning to achieve and that and ultimately putin is better at geopolitical game than the collective west as they call it or as the united states uh, we as the united states should be smarter we have more resources. Our military are way more intelligent and educated, and that's not even touching the surface, say, in a way more. But, um, and yet, somehow, we are losing the major st strategical situation. Uh, if you look at the world overall, it's not just America, it's the elections in Europe right now today it's slovakia we have elections in poland very difficult situation uh and uh, the the i wouldn't call it a crisis or a conflict but difficult situation that is now evolving when it comes to poland and ukraine and part of it again is the kremlin doing that's what they're doing they so in discord it is it has been going on i know each one of you guys and I, we were all talking about this for, for ages, since yeah. I since 2015, and yet we're not able to get through. And what I describe here is the result of this uh, inability to get this message and to start acting and responding 
differently to the Kremlin aggression, because that's what it is. It's the war, it's the hybrid war of aggression. If we don't stop it now, there will be conventional war coming to America, coming to Europe, just the way it came to Ukraine. They will not stop, they will continue moving. We need to act and we need to act now. Otherwise, not only we as the Americans, not only we as the Westerners will be complicit in this genocide and this ecocide that is happening here, but we will be affected and we will eventually get Russia in our, not backyard, but in our own houses. So that's the warning. And that's coming to you from somewhere where a year and a half people would not believe that Russia will uh, attack. Now to answer your question, Jim, uh, with Wagner, uh, I am uh, in the south of Ukraine. It's a southern front. Uh, Wagner rights were not here traditionally. They were employed in the east uh, near uh, Donetsk and Luhansk area. Uh, that's where the remaining uh, Wagnerites are still now. Uh, and here is an interesting point, and it's again going back to the information warfare, because recently CNN has reported that more Wagners are now arriving to the front. And then um, I listened to a couple of good experts here in Ukraine and analysis. And apparently there were just few former Wagner um, soldiers, fighters, who were now serving as a regular troops uh, part. Uh, and basically there was informational dump to CNN and as in many instances, uh, when uh, even the New York Times or the Washington Post or quite respectable publications do not check the information and they go for a loud story and then they spread misinformation that then is being amplified by the Kremlin sources and basically it's a psyop as usually aimed to spread terror because they use fear um, as a weapon, terror is weaponized. And because Wagner uh, troops were scary, that is meant to demoralize Ukrainian army and Ukrainian population. But little do they know, uh, it's very hard to demoralize the Ukrainian population and Ukrainian army. I've been to the front, they are not demoralized. They understand it's a psyop but the West doesn't. That's right. Hi-Fi, jump in. So you, you talk about the Ukrainian troops, and one of the things I think that's uh, been most effective uh, for the Ukrainians is their use of social media and their use of interviews and spokespeople. Um, do you feel that mainstream media, corporate media, is ignoring the situation in Ukraine, especially when it comes to like you're, you know, you're being constant bombardment in Kherson. Uh, you know, there's things going on in Odessa. Everywhere we look in Ukraine, uh, there are war crimes. Do you feel like American corporate journalism is failing Ukraine? Uh, I, I don't like generalizations. There are some good reporters who are doing their job well. But the overall tendency is um, not paying enough attention and not um, being, not using enough scrutiny, not going into detail, not going in depth. Because what usually happens, Hi-Fi, um, there would be several journalists arriving on a trip, on a business trip, uh, for a few days, uh, there's a wait uh, because it's not easy to get approval. It's a war situation. There are many so-called red zones where journalists are not allowed. And sometimes journalists break these rules and uh, report something that is not supposed to be reported, break operational security and endanger Ukrainian troops. And it happened many times. So the Ukrainian authorities in charge of press made it very difficult to get um, the permit. Uh, in, in order to get here to Kherson, our film crew had to wait for a month. And that 
provided we, we are based here, then our work is very well known. They, they know us because we are there on the ground and interview them a lot. And still it took a month of checks. And, and it, I'm glad that they're doing it, in fact. So not every journalist has a patience, time, or finance to, to, to do that, to get what they want to get. Only bigger publications do. They can afford it. Freelancers usually can't. It's expensive, and then you're not paid enough to cover for your expenses. So that's through no fault of journalists, uh, just circumstantial. And then the, the bigger publications usually... We are lucky when somebody who knows the region, speaks the languages, and an expert comes over, like the Guardian's Luke Harding, or my yes. colleague, like I said, Paul Conroy, or John Sweeney, who is based here, or a number of journalists who know what they're talking about. But many times it's not the case, and there will be somebody who covers different wars and conflicts around the world. They are not familiar with the specifics. Uh, they would know Harker from Kherson, whatever yes. starts with Ha is a Ha, you know, they mix up. It that happened many times, believe me, uh, in Associated Press, the uh, Freedom uh, uh, Square from uh, uh, Harkov was published as the Freedom Square from Kherson. Mm -hmm. And uh, or people in the New York Times would uh, publish something about liberating Harkov where in fact they mean liberating Kharkov Oblast because Kharkov as a city was never seized. And there are details which need to be specified, you know, when yes. journalism is properly, it needs to be verified. But then people don't have enough money or funds or attention. Uh, and also uh, because of the language barrier, it, right. it oftentimes that fixes and producers, local people take the crew somewhere. And but at this point, let's face it, the local producers are tired. Two years of war, everybody had losses. Everybody is mm -hmm. living through extremely hard situation. Not every fixer would want to risk their life going to the trenches or to the... And a lot of them would, but some of them you know, understandably would be tied and wouldn't make it all the way. And because the journalists don't have the no linguistic knowledge expertise, they wouldn't know where to go. And as a result, they end up somewhere where everybody goes interviewing the same Baba Luda who says the same story and everybody gets the same story. And then everybody, you know, like an echo chamber. Yes. Talks about this Baba Luda who is wonderful, but there's, then there's her son, and right now is basically um, it's a desperate cry for help, and not for me, but for the city yes. because there's no coverage. If there are any journalists listening to me, please get your crew, get your equipment, get your cameras, come over here, get the permit, ask for it. This needs coverage. There, yes. this genocide happening in complete darkness two of us covering the story not enough thank you so much for that important and nuanced answer there's genocide occurring in darkness right now and that is the one of the messages that we are going to be uh certainly getting out in the way that we can uh zarina i just want i'm going to read you two things um and then I have, have another question, but uh, one of my allies sent me a message uh, today that the deputy chairman of the state Duma said that Russia should annex four more reason, regions in Ukraine, among them Odessa. When you hear that kind of stuff, how do you respond as a person who understands all of this shit and is also reporting on it, risking your life? And, and I, I know you never want it to be about you, but you know, you are there and you're reporting and this is what, you know, uh, Russia is reporting. Well, Odessa is in fact my second hometown. I consider it my hometown. My ancestors are from there. My grandfather was from there. My great grandparents lived there. I spent a lot of time there as a child. Um, and uh, this is the city that I love the most in this whole entire world. But that having been said, I want to quote another journalist, a Ukrainian journalist and a friend of mine, Julia Horodetska, um, who 
was in Odessa in July when it was under fire really badly and there was a lot of damage a lot of destruction uh, and um, julia's apartment uh, got damaged there was not a big damage thankfully but there was some glass broken in her building and uh, many after many sleepless nights um, she slapped on this bright red, like million dollar red lipstick, and she was very pale, you know, and she said, um, into the video, you know, she took her phone and she said, uh, you want Odessa? How, I'm trying to, of the best way to translate it. And she said, like, um, uh, so, you know, there was a meme going on, Russian military ship, go fuck yourself yes. in the beginning of the war. Yes. So it was similar. She said, like, you want Odessa, go fuck yourself. <laughs> and that, beca that became a meme. Like, everybody, including the most puritanic in terms of language people who wouldn't say a bad word, were repeating it. Women started to put the red lipstick on and they would say there were graffiti saying like, I love it. Say the way they are, and so that's what I say. If they want Odessa, they can go fuck themselves. They will never get Odessa. That, that is just not important. That's not the type of city that will either surrender or we'll go for anything. People there are very resilient and they they love, they, you know, Kherson is very strong. People are very, very strong and through everything they live through, it's to see my friends here. By now I have many friends because I've been coming here since liberation very often and I see their house has been damaged more and more. I see how their families leave. Some people were injured. It's it's painful to see that. But I also see the strengths and the power, the power of resistance. Uh, what, when it comes to Odessa, there's all this. Plus, there is this uh, infamous sense of humor where everything is a joke. The amount of indecent jokes about Vladimir Putin and Russians going on around after this, uh, you know, call of the Duma, I, I don't even want to know. <laughs> I, I, I'm, yes, this is, um, that's amazing. I, I just uh, was sent another um, message just now um, about how the Russians have painted over the last Ukrainian mural in Mariupol which was called Toward Happiness, and it shows a strong woman with a bird. And you and I have talked about this. Um, first, like, how do you respond to something like that? Because it really is such a, just such a disgusting shit thing to do. Um, and so what is your response to something like that, where they actually t take something beautiful from, from the city and just erase it? In all honesty, compared to everything else they did in Mariupol specifically and in Ukraine overall, and after everything I have seen and been reporting from, namely Mariupol Center in Odessa, which has about 5,000 displaced persons. Um, for instance, I spoke to this incredibly impressive 81-year-old lady, uh, mm -hmm. which I would never call an old woman. You should have seen her posture, her hair, her lipstick again, um, and the story she was telling me. And I don't want to go into the graphic descriptions of the horrors that she told me, uh, but we are talking the horrors of the level of Babin Yar, or the level of Auschwitz, a level of Svensson. We're talking about body parts in the streets. I will stop there. And this woman has the force to now study English from scratch just to keep herself going. And uh, the, the, that's as far as Mariupol comes. Um, when I see what they, they're doing in Kherson, the buildings that they are destroying every day, I see the newly destroyed buildings. I see what was a building yesterday and what is a pile of smoke and ruins today. And when you see the crater of the aerial bomb, 
where yesterday it was not. And what's the worst, you see, you see innocent civilians killed. The graffiti on the wall pales compared to it. It's a symbol, and it's a symbol of their barbaric neglect for humanity, yes. But overall, on the overall scale of the of the misery they inflict on Ukraine, it's it's not even like the latest chapter in the book. There will be one day a very long list of all of their crimes, of everything that they've done. And then there will be the, the culture and the graffiti on the walls. But for now, for me, is the human life, children's lives, um, it, animal lives, anything living, the, the nature, the ecocide, the the... the her son oblast is one of the most mined areas in the world. Every day or every other day, there's a farmer being torn in pieces from stepping on the mine while trying to uh, grow uh, crops. Uh, so the the number of crimes committed here on hourly basis. I mean, in fact, you might not hear it because I have my windows closed and I have the curtain, but there's a the rumbling of explosions going on outside now, which means somebody's been killed here, very, very close to where I'm talking. We, to we, we, do, we do hear it, Serena, and I don't know how you've been withstanding it for going on two years. And again, I know you never make it about you. You always say you're doing your job, but it's the people. But, you know, as somebody who knows you, watched, you know, just your your grace when you were here and then watched how you could not wait to get back to Ukraine. I mean, this it still just blows my mind. Well, we're all thank you, but we all do our jobs. You guys are fighting there, which is equally important because it's information warfare. And I know that you all three of you spend endless nights, sleepless nights, fighting the same enemy, fighting the information warfare, for which I'm very, very grateful. And at times, I can tell you, Heidi, uh, it might be easier to confront something physical than the invisible enemy, because here, at least, it's very clear. The evil is very obvious. It, you cannot argue with it. It's, it's into your face. It kills the civilians, it's very hard to be or impossible to be on their side. You you fight in the fight. I, I know I've been into your shoes. I know how difficult what all three of you are doing. There is an invisible enemy sipping into your thoughts, trying to twist every word. And in some ways it's harder. So thank you for doing that. Um, I, I just wanted to uh, I, I wanted to ask you if you would um, to talk just briefly about your previous documentary. Uh, I had the privilege of, of being there with you at the Los Angeles premiere. It's an absolutely devastating film, um, and and so I'm looking forward may not be the right word to the next one, um, but I wanted to make sure we give our viewers a reminder. Um, of the work that you've already done with, with Byline, because it's really important. Well, thank you for bringing it up, because in the wartime, everything is ages ago, eons ago, and this film seems to be a long time ago. Uh, but it's not. It was We just finished it in summer, and it premiered, as you know, in Los Angeles, San Francisco, and London, in Kiev, and recently in September in Odessa. It was a very interesting experience of giving interviews in Ukrainian for Ukrainian television and radio, uh, which was very impudent of me because my Ukrainian is far from perfect, but I can speak it. And people here are very gr gracious um, and they forgive you for making the mistakes because you are speaking the language. So I had this opportunity um, and uh, it was very meaningful to share the film in Ukraine in Odessa because Ukraine is a very big country uh, it's not big if you, you compare it on the map to Russia but if you compare it to other European countries it's huge and it's 
divided geographically. In fact, it's divided, it's cut in two by the Dnipro River on the bank of which I'm currently uh, talking to you from. Uh, and uh, say people in Donbass um, don't know very well what's happening in Odessa or Lviv, and equally people in Odessa or Lviv understandably don't go on vacation to Donbass. There's a war going on there for nine years and the horrible things going on there for the last year. Uh, so um, in a way, it was interesting even for Ukrainians to see through our eyes, through the eyes of the foreign journalists, uh, what is happening at the Eastern Front or in Kherson, which again is very difficult to access and few people come here these days. But uh, I think it was even more important and way more important to present this to the Western and to the global audiences, not necessarily Western, Eastern as well, African, you name it, to the world outside of Ukraine uh, to, to see, to understand the life the daily life of ordinary people. We did we did visits with the military and I reported from the front together with the film crew and separately, but our focus was not the military because most people watch some war films and have some idea of how it's going. Although this war really is more like uh, Erich Maria remark, you know, it's like yeah. World War One, even. Yeah not World War II, with the elements, you know, but um, few people understand that it's just this daily survival. It's living without, try living without water and electricity, and these yeah. days without internet, because you're cut off from yeah. your family, from your loved ones. Yeah. Uh, say in the city of, city town of Siversk, which is very ruined, I saw a person trying to reach a signal from the uh, very top of the destroyed five-story building on the roof that you know the ruined roof they were trying to like mama mama so uh, you know these things uh which, which which usually people don't understand so we were trying to reach out with a message from ukrainians they asked us they told us tell them what's going on and that's basically what we're trying to do plus we by doing this we were confronting the russian propaganda and the russian uh, information warfare campaign again because they claim that they do not uh, attack civilian structures that they don't attack critical infrastructure and that uh, basically, uh, the reports of heating hospitals, educational institutions, schools, kindergartens uh, are not true. It is true. We've seen it with our own yes. eyes. Yes, filmed it. It's very important to note um, for those who want to see this uh, first film. We're referring to the title is now "Under Deadly Skies." Um, we will certainly post the information on where they can see it. And uh, Hi-Fi, do you have any final thoughts? I actually think we should go out on a clip from that movie. Okay, that's what and we'll do. Just to add, it is available on Apple. It is available on Amazon Prime. It is available pretty much anywhere. Fantastic. Just, just the deadly Skies, and it's inexpensive, and you can watch it. Yeah. Fantastic. That is so good. So we'll make sure we update that. Zarina, um, you've answered, you know, m more than I can say, and it's going to take us a minute to all reflect on this, but is there anything else you want to leave our viewers with some, some additional thought? I, I really appreciate everyone who's taking time to listen and to stay through this difficult talk. I know that there is certain fatigue. I know that there are other things that trouble you. I know things are not easy going in America or in Europe. And I know that there's an understandable desire to distract and watch a chick flick or, or a football game or just not watch anything and zone out. I understand it. And that's why 
it is so important to me that you are able to be here. If you're listening to me now, that means that you were able to stay with the people of Ukraine, feel their pain, feel their tragedy unprovoked, and perhaps help them to overcome this, I don't have a word for it. These are not circumstances. These are not, not even tragedy. The war, the terrible war that the Russian Federation is waging on a, on a sovereign country. This country needs your help. You have the power to reach out to your elected politicians. We Americans are lucky to have democracy. We have elected politicians who are at least supposed to listen to their voters. Don't let them withdraw help to Ukraine, because if you do, that will be genocide. That will be one global war crime. And we as humans cannot make it happen. As simple as that. And so for that, thank you so much. I want to add here, Paul is writing his diaries. That it's called Kramator's Diaries by Paul Conroy. And he writes about our experiences. And I do podcasts. Uh, they are radi radio podcasts on the malcontent news three times a week with reports from Kherson and interviews of people from Ukraine. I bring you Ukrainian voices. I translate them. I speak to people who speak English and you can get a better picture and understand what is happening with more richness. Thank you, Zarina. Thank you to Paul. Thank you for the work that you're doing. For a long time, Vladimir Putin has been waging war on Europe. His invasion of Ukraine is just one part of that wider war. Armoured cars and tanks and guns are sent to Ukraine. But he deploys more insidious weapons too. Only military facilities are being destroyed. Every day the Russian propaganda machine goes into overdrive to deny its crimes. To rewrite history as it's taking place. To find out the truth, you have to get to the source, right to the front line. <laughs>